Because I stand the rest of the Seaway Valley. Good morning and welcome to a live edition of Seaway on Wednesday to Wattala. My name is Reem Cook, and uh, we are glad to be with you uh, today. The original air day of the program live is uh, Wednesday, November 17th, 2021. We remind you right off the bat, views and opinions expressed by our guests and our callers during uh, the Duatala, not necessarily those of 97.3 CKLN or the Aquazaste Communication Society. And I have four guests joining us today, and we're going to be discussing uh, the third dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. And we're going to have a conversation about that today for those individuals that are choosing to uh, go with the uh, third dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. We're going to provide some information for you on that, where you can get it uh, if you make that choice to do so. So we have four guests joining us uh, today on the uh, program, and uh, we are taking a look at the Mohawk Council of Aquazase, uh, Grand Chief uh, Abram Benedict. Uh, we also have joining us today, Janet Brandt. Uh, she is uh, one of our uh, nurse practitioners, RNEC. We have Leslie Biro, who is our community health program manager. She's an RN as well. And we have uh, Dr. Ogisto Horn, and she joins us today as a leader under the Holistic Health and Wellness Program. Uh, and today, as we mentioned, we're talking about the third dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. For our listeners that are on the southern portion of Aquazase, this is also known uh, in the States, they use the word booster. Over in Canada, it looks like north of the line, they use uh, the wording third dose. So uh, discussing that uh, today, uh, the Mohawk Council of Aquazasi. If you have any questions about the uh, third dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, you can give us a call at 518-358-3427, 613-575-2101, and uh, we'll be sure to get your question out there. Uh, we will be wrapping up uh, at about uh, 10 to 11. We do have uh, some patients that some of our medical personnel have to get to at 11. So we're going to start winding down at uh, 10 minutes to the hour. Any questions that I do not get, I always forward to the Grand Chief's office uh, or communications unit for MCA so that they can get those questions to our medical and uh, officials uh, in our leadership uh, if you have uh, questions that we do not get to. So I know that uh, uh, we're going to be starting off this morning with uh, Mohawk Council of Aquazase Grand Chief Abram Benedict. Sego and welcome, Grand Chief. Sego Reen, and good morning. Good morning to all of you, and thank you very much for giving us an opportunity to uh, share some information this morning about a uh, very important um, element in our... Uh, and we're having uh, some issues right now, uh, technically, uh, with uh, the Grand Chief's uh, uh, introduction. So what we're going to do right now is... Uh, uh, let you know, again, our phone lines, if you have any questions, you can uh, give us a call at 518-358-3427-613-575-2101. Uh, Grand Chief, we'll try one more time. If you could uh, uh, give us a, a shout out, please. Absolutely. Can you hear me now, Reen? All right. So let's uh, let's try and uh, narrow this down. And I apologize with Zoom. We have to uh, do our very best to get people on the air. Uh, Dr. Horn, can you uh, unmute and uh, just say good morning to everyone so I can test you? Good morning, everybody. No oh, having issues. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back and uh, I'm going to come back and we will uh, try to rectify this. I do apologize to everyone. Uh, we will get back uh, on the air as soon as possible. That's not it. Uh, and uh, we will be right back right after this. When you brought it in, well, that has to be right there.
Um, okay, Abram, can you unmute? We're just checking our end technically. Yeah. And can you just hear me now? Say hello. Okay, hang on. Okay. Good morning, Reen. Can you hear me? Okay, talk, Abram. Good morning, Reen. We can uh, hear each other on this. Oh, there we go. That's that button. Okay, okay. we're good. Take Josh, when you bring it in, you have to yeah. carry it like that. Okay. And we are back. Sagawa Kuzasi and the rest of the Seaway Valley. Uh, we'd like to welcome you back to uh, Digital Tower. My name is Reen Cook. Had some technical issues off the top there. And I do apologize uh, on our behalf. And uh, we will get started now. Uh, we are ready to go. We're going to uh, get things underway with the Mohawk Council of Akwazase Grand Chief, Abram Benedict. Sego and welcome, Grand Chief. Sego, Reen. It uh, never fails. The technology always uh, gets us when we're, when we're all set to go. So Yamagoa, as always, and thank you uh, to CKLN for making some time this morning. Thank you for uh, the, uh, our MCA health team for joining this morning. Um, as we continue to move uh, through the pandemic, the global pandemic in our community and in the world around us, uh, one of the tools that we have at our, you know, we have been using to keep uh, ourselves and our community safe is uh, the vaccines. So we have uh, been sharing information at the MCA as well as we have had other uh, talk shows uh, with yourself, Reen, and the community about uh, vaccines, uh, how effective they are. Uh, you know, answering questions about uh, what the vaccines are made up of, uh, talking about logistics and where you can be vaccinated, and sharing the important information about uh, vaccinations and, you know, how they protect us. So today we are talking about uh, predominantly the third, uh, third dose or a booster, what, what it's been referred to as well. And uh, we want to share information with the community about that, what that means to you, uh, what that uh, you know, means for our community, as well as talk about the logistics. So how uh, the community can uh, either get vaccinated for the first time or second time, and then uh, potentially uh, receive uh, the third dose or booster uh, for uh, the vaccine in, in order to keep themselves uh, you know, protected going forward. So I'm pleased to join the panel today uh, that will be sharing uh, lots of information and taking questions from the community uh, on the, the, uh, the booster or third dose. So Reen, I'll turn it back to you. All right, thank you. Uh, and again, that is uh, Mohawk Council of Aquazase Grand Chief Abram Benedict talking about the third dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. So uh, perhaps we could start off with a question uh, having to do with what purpose does a third dose serve? Uh, so uh, looking at those dates that are coming up, we will also provide those for you. So grab a pen and a paper uh, on when uh, the sessions will be held under the direction of the Mohawk Council of Akwazasi and the Community Health Program for their jurisdiction. So I'm going to go with Dr. Horn on this one. Uh, Dr. Horn, if you could uh, start us off as we welcome you to the program, what purpose does a third dose serve? Okay, good morning. Hi, everybody. I am. Um... You're asking about what purpose does a third dose serve. So really in general, our bodies um, are always in the state of turnover. So um, our bones, all of our tissues, our cells, our, our, our cells in our blood, every our, our proteins are always turning over. And so, um, and so um, they get old and then they, by senescence, they just die out. And so, over time, everything changes, and things like um, things like your immune response to something will be, um, eventually um, go down, and eventually um, um, go to the point that you are not uh, reliably protected. And so, a booster shot or a third dose is going to remind your body, "Hey, don't forget, this is what we're we're watching out for." And so then your body once again, you know, puts out the word to the rest of the of your immune system, and boom, you've your your um, your um, your amount of uh, of immunity up. Your cells have been increased in numbers, and they're awake again. So I guess it's just to wake your body up from having, uh, you know, gone to sleep. Okay. 
You're muted, Reen. And I got to tell you, it's uh, it's been a long uh, uh, pandemic. So again, thank you, uh, Dr. Horn, uh, for that third dose of the COVID-19 vaccine and uh, what purpose that serves. So again, we're uh, talking with MCA health officials as well as leadership uh, with regards to the distribution of the third dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. So we want to make sure right off the bat, everybody knows when it's going to be administered. So let's get to that location and dates of the clinic. Uh, let's uh, get to that. Uh, we will um, uh, talk to uh, Janet Brandt, nurse practitioner. Uh, Janet, I know that uh, you've been working on the front lines with everyone as well through the whole pandemic. And for both of you, thank you very much, uh, um, Janet, and also uh, Dr. Horn uh, for uh, making sure that our health is, is taken care of, whether it's COVID related, whether it's our regular screenings, whether it's a disease that we're living with and trying to manage. Um, you've seen a lot of colds, flus and allergies, uh, things of that nature and everything in between. So uh, looking at the actual dates uh, and times uh, for the uh, uh, distribution of the third dose of the COVID-19. Uh, Janet Brandt, Sago and welcome to the show. I go, Rain. Thanks for having me, and it's always a pleasure to talk and work with the the bigger team and get the information out to the community. So the um, third dose vaccines will be starting um, next week on Thursday, November twenty fifth. Um, we'll be working out of AMS. So um, the three days of vaccines, the twenty fifth, twenty sixth, and twenty seventh, will be. Um, on the island at AMS. Um, they will be offering both um, Moderna and Pfizer. So people, um, if they have a preference, will be able to offer uh, or um, ask for one or the other. Or if they don't care, they um, can get a surprise. There you surprise go. Surprise vaccine. So should we care? Does it matter whether, you know, we've had our first uh, couple of shots of Moderna or our first two shots were Pfizer? Uh, does it matter which booster we get? No, not at all. It's, okay. it's the same vaccine. All right. Now, for those, who, for those who might have gotten uh, Johnson & Johnson or AstraZeneca, does that matter? No, in fact, um, the recommendations for people who had two doses of AstraZeneca is that they get at least one dose of Pfizer or Moderna. Okay. All right. Uh, and one other question before we uh, continue uh, through. Um, for those that are on the southern portion or even those that are on the northern portion, uh, does it will Canada recognize a booster given on the state side or even a vaccine on the state side? There is a, a way to register your vaccines with the um, Ontario government and the community health, and I'll defer that to Leslie, but community health has put the information out on both Facebook and um, through um, our, you know, day-to-day -day announcements as to how to get your vaccines registered in both Quebec, um, Ontario, and those who were vaccinated in the U.S., Okay, thank you, Janet. Let's turn to Leslie Biro and Leslie Biro joining us today. She is our uh, community health program manager, uh, RN, and uh, she leads a great team. And again, they have been on the front lines through this whole thing, face to face with individuals who might have COVID, uh, with the testing and um, face to face with people and contact tracing uh, to make sure that our community is as safe as possible. So, Sego and welcome. Always a pleasure, Leslie Biro. Thank you, Rain. Thank you so much. It's nice being here. Nice. Now, uh, with the community health program, and um, this is just another um, uh, item on their to-do list, which is really important for individuals that need uh, proof of uh, the uh, vaccination uh, for themselves. Um, you know, and utilizing both stateside or, or and or. Uh, the uh, Canadian uh, um, administering of the vaccine. So how has that been going for the community health program? And again, uh, if you could restate the process of how we go about getting proof of our vaccine, whether it's for travel or um, you know anything that we need that for. Okay, so yeah, um, there's different routes for it depending on where you got it. 
if it has been obtained within community health program, we are actually able to input it right away. So on these third dose clinics, we are gonna have printers there. So you're walking away with a piece of paper to say you got it as your proof. Um, for if you live in on the state side and you need to transfer that, you can send that to, there's a link on the tribe uh, website to send it to. So they will actually input it to the New York State Excelsior Pass system. Um, we do have a nurse within our program that is able to register with Quebec for those people with Quebec health card numbers. Right now we're trying to figure out the process of if you don't have that Quebec health card number to get that information inputted to get your QR code. There is a way through Ontario um, and I do have that written out and I can share it with communications to send that back out again. Okay. Um, now, during the program, I might ask you a couple of questions that we've already asked. It's just for individuals uh, that are tuning in a little late. So, uh, again, if I received my first two shots through the Sybridges Mohawk Tribes Vaccine Clinic at IGA, am I able to get my third through the Mohawk Council of Aquazase uh, administration of it next week? Yeah, so if you'd received your two shots, your first two series, and you still meet the qualifications, I believe they're the same over there as they are over here. There's a six month wait interval time between your last dose, your second dose, and before you qualify for your third dose under most conditions. So if you can bring proof with you, that's fine. Okay. We'll be doing that. Again, we're talking about the third dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, these are Mohawk Council of Aquazesti officials from our health department and also from our leadership. Uh, we're talking with Grand Chief Abram Benedict, uh, also uh, family nurse practitioner Janet Brandt, she's an RN as well, uh, Leslie Biro, community health program manager, and also Dr. Ojista Horn. Uh, who leads our doctors uh, and uh, our health department under holistic health and wellness. So continuing on, if people have questions, again, uh, we're going to be wrapping up about 10 to 11. Uh, the COVID-19 third dose vaccine clinics are November 25th, 26th, 27th, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Aquazus and Mohawk School on Goanoga, Cornwall Island. Uh, we saw the school be closed. Uh, someone would like to know, is it safe for everyone to go there and, and get the vaccine? Is school going to be in session when they go there? Um, how is that uh, going to work for uh, individuals that have questions about where it's going to be held? Let's so, go with school, less so the school is currently, yes, they're closed. Um, they are going to be cleaning, disinfecting it. School will be in session for two days prior to that before we're going in, but they take their, they clean everything. So it's safe. All right. So eligibility. Uh, I know in the state side, they started the same way that they did uh, back in January uh, with regards to over 65 and those with immunocompromised uh, systems uh, regarding uh, the ability to get the vaccine. So are there any other eligibility requirements uh, through uh, the Mohawk Council of Aquazase? third dose of the COVID-19 vaccine? I can answer that question. Um, the So the eligibility is the same as it was when we rolled out the vaccines the first go around with the first doses. However, um, the interesting part of this is that um, First Nations or Indigenous people are part of that priority group. So just about, we all qualify. Uh, basically as um, the same as anyone over 70 or um, immunocompromised First Nations are in that group. So we all qualify for um, priority. Okay. Um, now we've been, uh, now we've been uh, going through the uh, pandemic for uh, a year and a half, close to two years, once uh, March uh, 2022 uh, rolls around. And uh, there's, of course, controversy with regards to the vaccine itself, administration, manda mandatory issues and things like that. Um, the other thing that people focus on a lot is the side effects uh, and not really focus on. That's part of the, uh, the duty that they have uh, as an individual and also to care for the health and safety of their family. So let's go with side effects of the third dose, if any. And uh, we'll go with Dr. Horn on this one. So hi, the side effects would be uh, similar to what you would have seen if it, 
the second dose. Um, with um, the second dose, uh, maybe the first dose you didn't have many side effects, but the second dose was uh, likely a little bit more. So um, sore arm, very sore arm, maybe a little bit of flu-like symptoms, um, um, maybe a little stuffy nose, um, but uh, this would last maybe two days and then and, uh, be resolved. Um, so it looks a lot like COVID, but it actually is um, your immune response against the uh, against the uh, immune response to the to the the vaccination. Um, so it it looks like um, like COVID, but it's actually a, a, um, what your body is supposed to be doing when you get a vaccination. Um, so um, in the third in the third uh, in the third in the booster or in the third shot, it would be very similar. Okay, uh, so continuing uh, through our questions, if you have an elder uh, with a uh, compromised immune system and gets sick off the flu shot and has similar concerns about the COVID-19 vaccination, is it possible for this elder to receive the children's dose of the vaccine and gradually be brought up to the adult standard uh, uh, dose uh, of the vaccine? And actually the um, uh, adult standard of immunity will be the other part of that. Uh, would they be able to get a children's dose? Are you talking about the flu vaccine or the COVID vaccine? I think that uh, they uh, are, are, are combining the two. Um, if you have an elder with a compri uh, compromised immune system and they um, feel ill or adverse effects from getting the flu shot, and they have similar concerns for when they get a COVID vaccination. Is it possible for this elder to receive the children's dose of the vaccine? And would that suffice for them if they'd like to go that route? So, so there's a bunch of things that are in that question. Um, first of all, if you're getting flu-like symptoms after you have a vaccine, that's a good sign. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Neither the COVID vaccine or the flu vaccine are live vaccines. So, um, you know, it's stimulating your immune um, system to, to build its antibodies against whatever it is that we're vaccinating you against. So that's, it's a good thing. And the symptoms are usually, um, you know, self-limiting. They, uh, you can easily treat it with some Tylenol or Advil and it lasts about 24 hours. That's for flu and for COVID. The COVID dosing for um, third dose is a bit different. Um, so it's a half dose for adults and um, it's not the same amount or same volume of dose that you we gave with the first two doses so the third dose is just a like dr horn was mentioning it's just a little reminder to your body like don't forget us you know uh you know what to do with this and just to stimulate your body to to remember um what it's supposed to be doing okay um so looking at the actual eligibility for individuals uh are there any restrictions um i know that when we first put those vaccinations out, we were like, get vaccinated, um, you know, come to our clinic. And, and then we started learning about some eligibility requirements uh, with regards to, um, you know, uh, as a um, example, residency or um, uh, Aboriginal or Indigenous status, things of that nature. Leslie, can you answer those for us? Uh, are there any restrictions on who can come uh, to the COVID-19 third dose vaccine clinics? being put forth by the Mohawk Council of Aquazeste, November 25th, 26th, and 27th, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. at AMS? Yes, I can. Um, so Ontario put out the, um, the guidelines for us. So they had priority targeted populations. They're looking at, like they did look at the first, second doses to say, all right, and I don't know if everyone remembers, but all of a sudden they were giving like long-term care, concrete settings, healthcare workers, the shorter interval between their doses where the rest of Ontario had to wait, I think it was four months, six months between it. So that's who they prioritized was those people who got the shorter, um, the shorter interval in the first go around. So they're looking at severely immunocompromised persons. Those people are actually eligible 
56 days after their second dose. That's the only difference in that time interval from your second to your third dose. The other groups are like we've already been into those homes and they're, they've been completed. Um, older adults age 70 and over, it's six months after your second dose. First Nations, Inuit, Métis, adults 18 years and over, including non-Indigenous household members. That's the six month wait period. Healthcare workers, any regulated healthcare professionals or any other staff member, contract worker, student trainee, registered volunteer, or designated essential caregiver. Those are the family members in the home who are assisting with the care of their loved one. There are six months after, and anyone who had received the two doses of AstraZeneca or one dose of the Janssen, Johnson & Johnson are eligible at this go around. All right, another question. Uh, if a person had COVID and they ended up uh, uh, getting through it, uh, complication-free recovery, things of that nature, and they developed natural antibodies to COVID, what is the purpose for someone to be fully vaccinated? So this is an unvaccinated person who contracted COVID-19, they survived, and why do they need to be uh, fully vaccinated? What's the purpose of that? And should they be? Let's go with Dr. Horn. So one of the one of the things I, one of the biggest things about this whole episode with COVID is um, that the whole pandemic is the whole idea of how do you diagnose them? When do you diagnose them? With what manner? And how do you know if it worked? And so that's why the science has always been changing. It's a moving target with the more information that we have. So that's the nature of science. If things change, recommendations change with the more information that we have, we just get better and better and more, more sensitive to what we're recommending. So right now, um, we're not doing testing of your antibodies to see if you've made um, a, a good immune response. That would be naturally what we would do. Um, like right now, we would test your, um, your immunity to rubella when you are um, pregnant to see whether or not we need to suggest a vaccination after you've had your baby when you're pregnant. So, um, and so we actually test how, what the amount of antibody in your blood is. And that's what we would regularly do. But in this case, we just don't have the resources to do that. And so just to be on the safe side, because you know we don't know individually if you have the immunity, but we're going to say you know just to be on the safe side, we would suggest you get the immune um, the um, the vaccination because we are not testing people for their individual immunity and whether or not they have sustained immunity after they had their um, illness. Because don't forget, people became severely ill or ill um, based on some underlying you know um, process that we may not we're not measuring or we don't know. So some people got severely sick and some people not sick at all. And we're not measuring what is different about those people. And it could be something very, you know, it could be genetic. It, we don't know what it is, but we do know that some people have a different response to the virus and they will have a different uh, set of symptoms and they will have a different amount of, of um, antibody response afterwards. And so just to be on the safe side, because we're not measuring, because everybody is different, we are suggesting strongly recommending that the vaccination happen, even though you, um, you had the virus, because we do not know what your individual antibody response was and continues to be months after you got sick. Okay, so if you did uh, contract COVID, how long do you wait uh, in order to get the vaccine? Until you're symptom free. Okay. All right, uh, uh, we're going to uh, uh, do uh, a lot of these questions, uh, again, just uh, right from the hip. Uh, and uh, we've got to get uh, a, a lot of them in between now and the next four or five minutes, okay? Um, so our next one would be, again, if I received my first two shots through uh, the uh, uh, tribe at IGA, can I get my third booster? If we could repeat that again for someone, can I get my third booster, uh, third shot or AKA booster through MCA and this outlet? Yes, as long as it meets all the eligibility requirements, it's that wait period and um, proof of the vaccination is shown. Absolutely. Are you, are you uh, um, doing children yet? Uh, the uh, uh, children for 
uh, the vaccinations? So um, 12 and over, yes, we are having clinics for that. And if, we, if there's somebody who is 12 to 17 that wants their first dose, they can come to this clinic as well. That's not a problem. The five to 11 year old is a little bit different. They're not supposed to announce it until maybe next week, but it's, it's Ontario. So it may be a week or two after that. Um, but we're waiting for the announcement and we're planning those clinics. Okay, perfect. Uh, regarding the tribe's vaccinations, uh, this individual received the Moderna vaccine. Uh, will it be recognized in Canada, like Ontario and Quebec? Can we get a liaison to register it with federal or provincial governments? That's interesting. Uh, Abram, uh, uh, Grand Chief, uh, what do you think about that? Have you been uh, asked that um, with regards to a liaison to register all of our different vaccines because we're getting them from different areas and we live and get our health care through different means, OHIP, QHIP, uh, the IHS? Yeah, so the um, <clears throat> we haven't looked at a liaison per se, but the community health is registering uh, the, the vaccines that they're providing and they're assisting community members in getting the, the, the vaccine receipts for the purpose of showing vaccination. So, um, you know, unfortunately, it's a little bit different in the United States right now. I mean, you can walk into restaurants in the United States or at least in upstate New York or in New York without showing proof of vaccination, whereas in uh, Ontario, you can't. So, I mean... The registry system for vaccinations has less of a bearing, uh, you know, on the southern side of the community than it does on the northern side, other than for international travel, right? So, I mean, you know, I mean, I think that people who are looking to travel uh, abroad, you know, should obviously do this very carefully, but also, you know, part of their travel plans needs to be the researching of what are those requirements for entry and exit uh, as part of those regular travel plans. But as of right now, uh, community health is assisting with the uh, the vaccinations that they have provided. Eastern Ontario is assisting if you've received the vaccination outside of, of Ontario. All right. Uh, another question. One of the panelists uh, 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 said that there's no live virus in the flu shot or COVID shot. If that's the case, then how does it prevent illness or build immunity? Dr. Horn? So, yeah, so um, the uh, mRNA virus, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a set of instructions, and this instruction is, is um, directed into the cell. The cell takes the instructions, read it, and then just like uh, in Harry Potter, it just disintegrates and it's gone. And so the body is left with, uh, with the, the instructions and they make the, the antibody. And so um, that's what it means when it's not live. There's no actual virus being put into you. It's just a, a, a list of instructions. All right, so uh, COVID-19 third dose vaccine clinics under the Mohawk Council of Aquazasa is set for November 25th. 26th and 27th, all three of those days, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., Aquazest and Mohawk School on Goanoge, Cornwall Island. Uh, Leslie, are appointments needed for this uh, particular outing with the uh, setup uh, under MCA for those dates, times, and locations? Not necessarily are the appointments needed. We are taking some appointments uh, just to give us like a rough draft of what we're looking at. So yeah, if you're welcome to show up there, we will determine eligibility um, upon check-in. And yeah, so appointments are not necessarily needed. All right, let's go back to uh, Grand Chief uh, Abram Benedict with this one. Um, sort of a political question, if you will, uh, and also having to do with the administration and, and what's being required of Mohawk Council of Aquazaste employees. Are Mohawk Council of Aquazaste employees mandated to get a booster? At this point, no. The MC employees are required to be vaccinated. So fully vaccinated right now is qualification as two uh, shots. If health um, professionals, uh, meaning, you know, Ontario and, and Health Canada say that now that in order to be classified as full vaccination, you are required to have a third shot, uh, then that that time it will change. But currently right now, it would just be uh, two shots. Uh, does anyone have the current vaccination rates and COVID-19 cases locally under the jurisdiction of MCA, I believe? That would be a Leslie question. All right, Leslie? <laughs> I, uh, yeah, so this morning we started, well, not this morning, yesterday as of 
the end of the day yesterday, we had five, a total of 512 cases. 15 of those were active. Our vaccination rate um, is minimally 30, and I'm gonna say minimally 30.99, um, but that's what we have given. It doesn't include anyone who got, went to college, got their vaccine there that we don't know about. It does include what Sarajus Mohawk Tribe gave as they send us those numbers, but it doesn't include if people got it early and went elsewhere. And also just to keep in every, it's looking at that population base of the three districts. People move, people are here and there. So that changes too. So okay. that's what I'm saying minimally. All so right. Now, Leslie, I know that uh, you had mentioned uh, Geoganus de Yakisata, they had received their, uh, their uh, vaccines, uh, their third dose. Uh, and are home visits being conducted for those that don't live in those facilities, uh, but uh, uh, aren't able to, um, you know, leave their home or maybe those that don't have transportation? Uh, what are we doing with uh, those individuals to help them if they choose to get the third dose of the COVID-19 vaccine? Okay, yes. Um, so anyone can call community health. Um, if they're homebound, we do provide that uh, during the time of our clinics, nurses or somebody will go out and give them their injection at home. That's been happening through the first, second dose, the flu vaccine clinic. So we do have a, we know about, about who, how many people we have at home. Okay. All right. So it is uh, 1055. We're going to stop. Uh, we're going to uh, go with closing comments and um, let's start off with uh, Janet Brandt. Janet, I know that you've got uh, patients at 11, so we want to make sure that they are tended to. Um, we appreciate everything that you do, Janet, for our community um, and uh, keep continuing to work hard. Uh, we don't know where we'd be without you. So thank you for being you and everything you contribute. Uh, Janet, do you have any closing comments, please? Um, just, I think I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that um, both Ojesto and I do look after uh, uh, people who um, are would now, I guess, be called the the long haulers. Um, so people who have had COVID and are continuing after you know their initial infection is um, finished and are still experiencing effects from COVID. Almost all, if not 100% of those people who were not vaccinated, got sick, especially with the Delta virus, um, are now saying or are getting vaccinated. They do not want to go through this again. Um, every single person is saying, I, I, I don't want to do this again. They, um, they were sick. They were in the hospital. They were faced with life and death choices. Um, we all know that some didn't make it home and the ones who are making it home are saying, I'm not doing this again. And they are being vaccinated. I just want people to understand that it's, yes, you do hear people, um, you know, get it and get better, but we're now on the fourth mutation of this virus with, you know, other mutations sort of coming up behind and, um, you know, this is why we're getting third doses is to sort of try and outwit the, the Delta virus and keep our bodies recognizing, you know, some something of a virus that um, the COVID vaccine has become. So I just want people to understand how important it is to get vaccinated. Okay, thank you, Janet. We appreciate it. Um, thanks for your expertise, experience, your empathy and your compassion. Uh, for your patients and for our community. Thanks, Janet. Thank you. Uh, we'll turn now to uh, Dr. Horn. Uh, again, uh, frontline. She's right there. She's, you know, meeting people for appointments at the clinic. She's doing phone calls. She's doing everything she can. She visits people in their home. She goes the extra mile and back uh, again, uh, 10,000 times and more. So Dr. Horn, thanks for all that you do for our community, uh, putting everybody first, making sure that health and safety of our families is the number one priority in your life. As we wrap up today, do you have any closing comments, Dr. Horn? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, the, um, this discussion is really, really important. And I think um, Janet's comments about how important it is to remember what this virus is. This virus um, is really, really scary. 
and it um, and there's something about um, what what they say is one of the worst ways to spend the rest of the end of your life is to be unable to breathe. And um, being unable to breathe is terrifying, and it's and, and and I would suggest that people who are afraid of you know wearing the mask over their mouth because they say they can't breathe should really consider getting the vaccination because COVID itself is going to be much worse than that. Um, a lot of um, there's been a lot of misinformation out there. I would strongly suggest people really take a sit, sit back and really uh, rethink if they are very much. Um, have very big concerns against the vaccination just to really, you know, call us and talk to us and and please reconsider. Um, it is a, a really um, terrifying um, way to spend um, the end of your uh, days or um, to and, and even if you get better. So I, I just want people to remember how serious this uh, illness can be. Thank you again, Dr. Horn. Uh, Leslie Biro, you lead a team that has done uh, somersaults uh, when they needed to. They've jumped in the water head first, not knowing what was in there. Um, you have uh, led a team that really uh, um, is probably very fatigued, very tired, um, but still keep coming to work every day, still keep doing what you ask of them, still keep doing what is a priority for our community. And again, that's health and safety. And you live that, you work that, you breathe that, Leslie. So does your team. Uh, as we look to uh, wrap up today, uh, what are your closing comments for community? Thank you, Rain. Uh, yes, um, I'd just like to thank you for the opportunity to bring this forward. Um, I think it's important because people will see this. It's on the radio, they'll hear it. A lot of not, not a lot of people listen or look at Facebook. Um, so yes, my team, I'm so proud of my team. They're, they've done everything. So um, all I have left to say is third doses. If you have any questions, please call us at Community Health Extension uh, 613-575-2341, extension 3220 for the home visits, for the shots. If you have any questions on it, any other COVID questions, we are doing still maintaining the testing site and doing the contact tracing and all the follow up for that. So with that, just please be kind with the small team I have. We've been trying the best. Thank you. Uh, and we'll wrap up uh, with the Grand Chief of the Mohawk Council of Aquas. I said one other question for you, Grand Chief. When we release those numbers that uh, we had talked about uh, regarding uh, the individuals that, you know, the positive cases, you know, we had four um, with our last report. We had 13 on Friday, which I think raised uh, a lot of people's like, wow, uh, you know, it, it is something to be, you know, when you have to say that word 13 compared to one or two, that's I think when it hits home and especially when it comes to our school. Uh, so a lot of people look at those numbers, the active cases, um, also uh, the, the current case load, the ones that we've had all together those that we have lost. Um, sometimes, Grand Chief, people are like, well, how come they don't tell us uh, whether someone who's contracted COVID was vaccinated or not? Is there a reason for that? Is that something that we can look to do in the future? Uh, have you been uh, asked about that uh, with regards to the statuses that are put out by the communications unit? Are we even able to say that with mm -hmm. health privacy laws and whatnot? Grand Chief, uh, if you could get that question and then closing comments from you, please. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I mean, obviously, as we continue to go through the pandemic, we're looking at, you know, how we report data, uh, what uh, data is collected, what, it, what data we're able to share. This is something that has just recently come about as well, uh, so that people can, uh, you know, know how many people are being vaccinated and uh, getting uh, COVID. You know, I think that, you know, we're not, you know, we don't want we're not, uh, we're looking to see what data we can continue to share. We want people to be informed and make informed decisions, right? But it's also, it's just, you know, I mean, today's uh, talk show and update was about, you know, sharing additional information about the third dose. It's important uh, that everybody get vaccinated. You know, I mean, yes, it is statistically known uh, that people can get uh, uh, COVID even if they're vaccinated, even if they're fully protected. Um, but, you know, I think that the story that, uh, you know, nurse practitioner Brandt has spoken about and having some of those folks that weren't vaccinated that got COVID and the terrible experience they had, I have heard firsthand from people who have, uh, you know, no kind of hindsight 2020, uh, knowing that had they gotten vaccinated and their 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 um, their their risks would have been lower, but also knowing that 
they likely would have not gotten uh, such severe um, you know, illness from it. Most people that are vaccinated that are getting COVID are not uh, ending up needing acute care in the hospital. In fact, I think most every, and all the updates that I've had with the hospitals and the region is that, you know, the unvaccinated are the ones that are filling up the ICU units. So, I mean, you know, we have to really think about that. Today's information was to continue to share new information, the dates for the third shot coming out. We want people to make informed decisions and know that it's important that we work together to save, to save lives, to keep us all safe and ensure that, you know, we're doing what we need to do as a community to keep us safe. So as always, Reen, we're gonna, we will continue to evolve on how we're, 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 uh, how we're sharing information, what information we can share, what information is being shared. You know, this has ever been changing since, since uh, you know, since day one, almost two years ago now. We were talking in single digits, we went into double digits, we went into triple digits in different areas. You know, we're at over 500 now in our community. So we, we will, uh, you know, we'll continue to evolve and share information with the community uh, so that everybody is well aware of what's happening in and around Akwesasnes. But as always, a great pleasure to join you uh, this morning. It's always a great pleasure to be with these three women and all of our healthcare professional staff that we have working day in and day out to keep ourselves, our community, our elders, and our most precious people and our young ones safe uh, as, we, as we continue to grapple with this pandemic on a day-to-day -day basis. So as always, Yamagoa, Yamagoa, Kwesasne for doing your part and uh, we'll see you uh, very, very soon. Yama. Thank you very much, Grand Chief of the Mohawk Council of Akwesasne. Grand Chief, thank you for always being there, uh, for being a leader right at the top of the organization, uh, having to deal with uh, uh, this, that, and the other thing, and the other thing too. So you have to deal with a lot of things politically uh, also uh, with regards to the, the organization itself and the lead that we take, uh, the role that we play and uh, which direction we're going to go in. So thank you very much, Grand Chief. Please give my best to counsel and uh, we appreciate everything that you do. It's a lot of weight on your shoulders. I can't uh, hardly see them anymore, uh, but uh, they are there. So thanks for doing what you do, Grand Chief, and uh, for being a great leader. Thank you. Now, uh, take care, everyone. Please stay safe. And thank you for all of your contributions to the health and safety of our community. Now, go on. Uh.